So, so we're gonna make some beer. What we're gonna do is, is John's Pale Ale, which is kind of the recipe that I often recommend for people starting out, because it's real easy to do. It's, it still has a little complexity to it, so it's a decent beer, but it's not over the top in any kind of way, so it's easy to brew. And, um, we're doing extract brewing. Um, more specifically, it's extract with, with steeping grains, which is kind of probably the most common way to start out. There's, there's extract by itself, which is basically somebody has made this syrup and you just mix it with water and, and cook it and, and ferment it and go. The more advanced, like what breweries do is called all grain, where they're using grain and they're basically making their own extract. And that requires extra hardware and um, being real precise on no, uh, temperatures and things like that. So the best way to start out is where somebody else has done that mash and the hard part for you. So that's what we're gonna be doing. Um, I have some, a, a couple gallons of water I have up in the front uh, right now in the refrigerator getting cold. So um, it's real helpful to have some for the later part of the process that's already cold to keep from cooling down. So first thing I'm gonna do is pop our yeast pack. I'm using Y yeast pack, which is a smack pack. Um, it's a liquid yeast and it just needs to activate. And there's a little activator pack in there. And we're gonna set this aside, let it warm up. It's gonna swell while we're brewing. And there's other types that you don't have to do that to. There's another one called Imperial that I sell a lot of that I really like a lot. That's a great yeast. There's also dry yeast that, um, if you use dry yeast, it's good to, to rehydrate it. Um, and it's good yeast as well. Sometimes it keeps a little bit longer than liquid yeast, but liquid yeast, because it's liquid, it's, it's already live and it's, uh, just basically raring to go. So first thing I'm gonna do is start heating up some water and we're gonna basically steep our grains in the water. We're gonna get this up in about the 150, 170 degree range. I usually start with about two, two and a half gallons, sometimes as much as three. We're gonna be adding the extract to it later, so we wanna be careful we don't get this too full, but as much as, as I can be boiling better off will be. I got these from the store, but you can use tap water. I just don't have real easy access to tap water down here, but if I'm brewing like this at home, I'll often fill these up. Or ideally, the best thing to do would be to boil the water the night before and then let it cool and put it in here so we know it's sterilized and sanitized through boiling. But honestly, the water that comes out of our taps here is, is pretty darn good. Usually a good rule of thumb for brewing water is if it, if it tastes good, then it's okay to brew with. The only thing in our water that I'd say stay in, that would make me want to stay away from it is uh, the chlorine and chloramine. So I use a charcoal filter when I brew at home, but it's not as critical for extract brewing as it would be for all grain, where it, that might affect the enzymes and things that are converting the sugars. In our case, the syrup that's in here has got already been done the best it can be. So, so I'm gonna get this fired up and get that water starting to heat up and then it'll be just like we're making tea. Now I'm doing this on a burner because it was too hard to bring my stove down here. But most people do this on a, on a kitchen stove. For this amount of water, it's, it's not too hard to do. Uh, it's almost the same weight and, and volume as making a stew or something like that. If we we're doing a full volume boil, where in like all grain broom, we boil seven or eight gallons, that starts to become the point where it's a little bit too much to do on the stove. That's the other nice thing about extract is that it doesn't require boiling as much so usually you can do it right there and another reason why a lot of times this is the style that people choose to learn with and start out with so. And I got my fancy thermometer right here and I'll actually leave this in it so we'll have an idea what it is. When it gets up to that point, we're just gonna basically steep the grains, which is a little different from the other process that I mentioned, which is mashing. Mashing, we've gotta keep it at a real specific temperature and it stays for an hour and the enzymes work with the starches in the grain because the grain is basically just little barley seeds. And I'll get a little more in depth in this later on, just what's going on here. but. These, each of these seeds wants to become a plant and there's starches and enzymes in there that'll help to feed that. And part of the 
that's malted to begin with, part of that process is to prepare those things to convert more to sugars that we can use for brewing. But then when it's held in the exact right temperature of water, those enzymes turn them into the right kind of sugars that the yeast want to eat for us. So, and that would be the mashing process. But like I said, that requires a, a mash ton to hold it at that temperature. So that's where we're going to use the grain. So we can kind of think of grains as two different types. There's base grains, which is where most of the sugars that come, come from in the beer. And then there's specialty grains, which is where most of the colors and the flavors come from. And the biggest difference is how it's been malted. Base grains are usually really light in color. What we've got here, um, they're, they're all malted, which is like they're, they're being tricked into germinating where they get all those things ready. But then after that, they're kilned in, in order to get the different colors. This is kilned really lightly. This is an example of a specialty malt that's been kilned a little bit more. The more you do it, the, the less the sugars are able to be fermentable. So the majority of the beer is a real light, even the darkest beer is a real light grain uh, that ha can really easily convert the sugars. These, these sugars will typically retain after fermentation, so the yeast can't eat them as well. Uh, so it might be 80 or 90 percent of the beer is this type of thing, but all of the special stuff <laughs> comes from these. Uh, and that's true so this, this is especially malt that's been, been kilned at a real high temperature for a short amount of time. They call them flash kilned. So you get a, a real crystallized flavor. Chocolate malts and black bar, they show the, the other end of it where they're, these would be at a high temperature for a long time. So they get a lot of color. It doesn't take much of it all to make that, those dark beers with these type of grains. So uh, it, it's interesting though that they're all two row barley. It all came from the same plant. Uh, Sometimes we'll use wheat and a few other things in it as well. So in this one, if we look at the recipe, um, we've got six and a half pounds of gold light extract. That's where basically all made from the pale malt and lots of the sugars that we're going to need. So that's the bulk of the base of the beer. The specialty grains that we have are half pound of Crystal 40, half pound of Carapils. Um, Crystal 40 is like this one. This is a Crystal 60. That number indicates the darkness of it. So sometimes you see a recipe that has uh, 20. The L stands for Lovabond, and Lovabond is just the, I think it's the guy that invented the scale. So um, crystal malts come in 10, 20, 40, 60, 80, varying darknesses. I don't want this to be a real dark beer, so we're using crystal 40 in it. Crystal 60 is not unusual in this kind of beer. So nice stouts use crystal 120. And as the numbers, in addition to getting darker, they get a little bit more robust mouth flavor and things, they get more plum kind of flavors and things like that. Uh, chocolate malt at this color, that's going to be 350 level bond. And then black barley is going to be usually around 450 or 500 level bond. And that's about as dark as it gets. There's one kind that's 550 level bond, real dark. Um, Black barley is actually kind of unique. There, there's two grains. One is called roasted barley and then black barley that are not malted. They're just kilned. And because of that, the malting gives you kind of a sweetest, sweetness to the flavor. Um, if it's not malted and just kilned, you get a little bit more edginess to the flavor. And so a lot of times stouts or those real dark beers will use a balance between the two of them. And that's what makes different stouts and different porters taste different is they'll have different balance between the malted barleys that are dark and the unmalted barleys that are dark. So that's kind of a cool thing. This beer doesn't have anything like that. So, so what we're going to have is the half pound of Crystal 40, half pound of Carapils. Carapils really is just for, uh, adds a little bit of mouthfeel and head retention. It's real similar to a Crystal 10 Love Bond, but it's even lighter than that. So heats up nice and fast on that kettle. So um, steeping bag is basically just like a big tea bag. Uh, all of the, my recipes I have set up either for extract that walks through all of these steps that we're going through or for the all grain brewer it would show the recipe for them without having the extract and what they would do. I usually put as much instructions there because usually that's a more advanced brewer uh, who's gonna 
who doesn't need all the instructions, they just need the numbers that we're trying to hit and that sort of thing. So these bags come in different styles. There's some that are disposable that basically you just use once and throw out. This is a reusable one. And I like this because then it's not as much waste, but it is sometimes a pain to clean these. So basically we're just gonna put our steeping grains into there. tie this off and then once that's up to into that range we're already just about at 120 degrees on it right now so it won't take too long to to get there then we're just going to put this in and let it sit like we're making tea we might dip it a couple times but it'll be surprising just how much color and and things flavor come from from that that's going to sit for about a half hour so uh in there before we add the extract and then we'll bring it up to a boil and kind of get more into that at that point so really want that temperature to be over 170 if we start getting up in the 180 degree range then you start running the risk of pulling tannins and astringent flavors out of the the husk material that's here so um some people 170 is a good target range over 170 is still okay but that's why on the sheets I usually say 160 to 170 because that gives you about 10 degrees leeway on either side. And you're still gonna have good results and big window to fall into. All right, we are gonna shut that off. It's actually about 176. That'll be okay, like I said, we don't wanna be over 180. It's gonna cool pretty quickly in here. This is basically just gonna go in here. I'm gonna put it in and you'll see it pretty quickly start to to color the water and, and uh, start turning into much more beer colored thing even just in this amount of time so I'll come back in the, in the process of this a couple times and and we'll lift it out of here the main thing is we want to make sure that all of the grain gets wetted in there um, then the other thing that I'll usually do at this point is I used to have a like closed clips that I'd clip onto this in this case I don't have that with me here I'm just gonna tuck it over there put the lid back on so that way there's a piece that's comfortable to grab a hold of. It, it, it's not a problem if all of this goes in, except for the fact that that's hot water I'd be reaching down into. And, and I like to try to avoid that. So, all right. So we're gonna give that about a half hour or so. Pretty wide windows. That's another nice thing about extract brewing is that our temperature windows are wide. Our time windows are wide. Nothing has to be real precise like it does if we're doing all grain brewing. See what this looks like here now. You can see it almost looks like beer just as it is right now. It's pretty amazing when doing this with the dark grains, just how dark that will get just from having this amount of it in there. And I may do that one or two more times as we go along just to make sure we're getting everything wetted. So, uh, we've still got 21 minutes to let it sit. If I was doing this at home, I'd have the benefit of being on a stove and having other burners. And I would have heated up a little bit more water uh, on that other burner up to that 160, 170 degree range in order to rinse these grains. Uh, I didn't do that. I'm still gonna rinse them a little bit just with the water we've got. It's been sitting out here in this heat, so it's gotta be close to 170 degrees, right? Um, and basically what the goal is, it's not something that we really have to do but uh, the goal would be that there's, there's some of those sugars and flavors that are still in this, and, and I want to be able to rinse those out and get all the mileage out of it. I still remember Larry's thing that he said was, you paid for that, you might as well get everything out of it. <laughs> I don't know why that sticks with me 20 some years later. But So I'm just going to rinse it a little bit more though, and then we're going to go ahead and move our, put our extract into there. And then I'm just going to set this aside. So right now I'm just basically rinsing this. Obviously hot water is gonna rinse it better, but we're still getting a little bit out of it just with doing this. So goal is leave as little of that stuff behind as possible. So that way we get as much of it into our beer as possible. And then we'll set this aside later on, I'll clean that so that way I can reuse that. Next step, we're going to get this extract in and definitely notice I'm doing this before we're turning the heat back on. If on the stove, we want to make sure we're not on a burner or something. 
so that way it doesn't scorch. It's heavier, so it's going to fall straight to the bottom. And uh, if, if the heat was on, then it, it will scorch and burn and we'll have these black flakes in there. So real important that we're going to add this in. We're going to make sure it all gets dissolved in here before we turn the heat on. You see, it's basically our syrup. Nice. It's always going to be a little darker just because of the condensing, consolidating process. And I'll probably scrape that a little bit to make sure we get everything out of there. Sometimes people will put a little bit of hot water in this and shake it around, and that's fine. Also, just to, to try to make sure we get all of it out of there. I usually just do it by scraping. And, and if a little bit's in there, it's not the end of the world. We've got big windows to, we can fall into here. This is also another reason why I kind of like these paddles that have the flat sides. Also at this point, sanitization isn't a big issue because everything here is going to get boiled. So it's all going to get sanitized through the boil. Later on in the process, that does definitely start to get to be more and more important. Just keep stirring and stirring. I can feel when I go through it here, I can kind of lift it up and you can see the extract on the bottom there. That's how I know that it still needs to be dissolved a little bit more. And basically I'm going to keep doing it until I can do that and not pick up anything from the bottom. The fact that that water is still pretty hot, that helps to, to dissolve it a little bit faster, but it takes a little bit. Um, extract comes in two different forms. This is the liquid extract. They can take it one step farther and, and basically dehydrate it. And that's where the dry malt extract comes from. Um, I kind of prefer the liquid, but dried works just as good. I feel like the liquid dissolves in a little bit faster, but in just one less step. Dry malt extract, though, typically stays fresh on a counter longer. So if, if um, like stores that don't move their extract very fast and at pretty low volume, sometimes you're better off getting a, a dry extract and than, than having the liquid extract. If the liquid extract has been sitting on the shelf for two years, typically it's probably going to be stale. So now we're looking good. Now if I start to scrape the bottom, we've got nothing on the end of that. And we got stuff that almost looks like a beer in here now. So... Next step, we're going to go ahead and get that burner back on. I didn't do a very good job pouring it, so I got too much of it up here. I want to get some of that, rid of some of that, but that's okay. And our next step is going to be bring it up to a boil. Which this often takes a little while. But with how fast it heated up earlier, I think we'll probably, it probably won't be too bad. Uh, so this is a, a pretty critical part of, of staying close to the kettle. Because uh, while it seems like it takes forever, if you were to step away from it, that's when it's going to boil over. Absolutely. Um, don't necessarily have to be really stirring it the whole time. I'm going to give it a little bit more just to really make sure that everything did get fully mixed in. And now that I've left it for a little bit, nothing settled down to the bottom. As it starts getting close to boiling, there's going to be a layer of foam that appears on top of it. It's called the hot break. And the hot break uh, is, is proteins that start to coagulate uh, in it. And it's both happening inside the wort. At this point, this is called wort. Wort is like pre-beer, right up to the point where we add the yeast. And at that point, as soon as you add the yeast, then it's beer after that. So right now, we're making wort than trying to make it as good quality yeast food <laughs> as we can. That hot break is, is a pretty important part of it. We want to have a good solid hot break. That layer of foam that's on the top of it, I prefer to just stir it and let it dissipate back into the beer. Um, some people though prefer to, to scoop that off and set it aside or throw it aside. Um, different things, read it. I've known really good brewers that get rid of it. I've known really good brewers that don't. My preference is to not get rid of it and let it fall back in. Um, later on, when we move to the fermenter, I'm going to pour through a um, strainer, and that'll catch some of that, those solid particles at that point. But if they get into the fermenter, it's not the end of the world either. That layer of foam that's going to happen here as we start getting close to a boil is, I, I usually will start poking little holes in it because it can cre act like a lid on the surface of it, and it can go from not quite boiling to really boiling really fast. 
and uh, w that's where it can be in danger of boiling over. So I'll usually both kind of make a hole in it so there's a place for the wort to, to air out, and I'll usually dip my temperature a little bit as well as we start getting close. So if you're doing it on a stove, as soon as you start to see some bubbles to where it looks like it's getting ready to boil, that'd be a place to drop the temperature down a little bit, even though it's gonna take a little longer to actually get to a boil, to be able to uh, get it to a controlled boil is, is important at that point. Once it does get to that point to where we've got the boil under control, then we'll start adding hops. It's interesting, you can see the, the proteins coagulating in here right now as it's, as it's coming up. It's not starting to foam, but sometimes it almost looks like it'll start looking like egg noodle soup <laughs> as they start getting solid and, and uh, all of those solids eventually end up dropping back out, but definitely something you want to see in good healthy wort. And it also is, is cycling the stuff around, so I could can stir it right now, but it's kind of doing some of that on its own. Now we're getting some more, more stuff going here too. You can see that kind of almost, like I said, egg soup kind of look to it. We're still not getting any of the hot break where it's gonna start foaming on top, but we're getting closer. We're looking for a, a, a moderate boil is what I say. Some people will say a rolling boil, but sometimes that can imply a little too much. So more than a simmering boil, but not so much that it's splashing in the kettle. What we want to see, there's some things that are being created during this part of it, some, some compounds that are in there that we need to boil away. They have scientific names that really don't matter. But the long and short of it is, if we have some steam coming off of this during the boil, they get volatized away and go away, and, and we don't end up with those flavors in the end product. So that's really the main goal of the, the quality of the boil, is to make sure that they're being volatized away. The other main thing we're doing in the boil is one, sterilizing, but that really happens in 15 minutes. The biggest part of it, and the reason we do a 60 minute boil is to have to do with the utilization of the hops. We get a little bit of foam on the top now. So that layer is gonna get thicker and thicker as we get closer to boiling. You can see that it's starting to boil in here. So I'm gonna back the, this down just a little bit so that way we don't, doesn't take off on me. I'm still not gonna start the timer. I'm gonna to wanna to let this all dissipate back in uh, and, and just sort of get to where the boil's under control and I don't have to constantly manage the temp. So we'll still give it a little bit more time. Also, when we add hops, sometimes we'll get another buildup of foam right at that point. And so if I was to dump them in right now, it would kind of double up on me and, and uh, it's a mess to clean up. Lose beer. And you could burn yourself too. I mean, there's definitely some danger to that, but, but we're starting to get to a good boil. And we've got some steam coming off of here. You can see in the areas where it's boiling that the, uh, that hot break layer of foam on the top is starting to dissipate back in a little bit. And, and as time goes along, I'll stir this a little bit too, and that'll kind of help it drop back in. And, and there may be a little bit of a layer of it during the whole boil. So my goal at this point now is just to get it to where that boil is under control and boiling at a level that I want it boiling at. Um, that's a pretty good boil right there as far as that goes. But being that I just turned the temp down, it could fluctuate a little bit here. So once I feel comfortable with that, then we'll start going into the hops and talk about just what the hops do. Main job of the, of the hops is preservative. That's how they were first discovered and first used before we realized that the flavors that they lent to it were real good. And on our recipe, we've got 60 minute edition of hops and we have five minute edition of hops. There's a lot of different elements that, that hops are gonna give us. At this particular edition, the primary thing is bittering that we're gonna get from them. And that is what really balances the maltiness of the beer. If you got a beer that's got a lot more malt in it, typically we can really increase the level of the bittering hops in order to keep that balance. Uh, a real light beer that doesn't have much in the way of maltiness, typically we're not going to want very much of the bittering. That's also a personal thing too. Some people like more, some people like less. Um, this particular beer is not particularly bitter. It's just going to use a half ounce of Chinook. Hops can also add flavors and aromas to our beer, which is, uh, comes from the oils in it. So right now, I'm putting about half of the packet in. I could weigh this and get really specific with it. And if I was trying to really recreate a beer that I've done before, I probably would weigh this out and make sure that it was exactly half an ounce. But at this point, I put about half of it in there and we're gonna add the other half towards the end. So 
there's different compounds in the hops and uh, there's, there's alpha acids, uh, there's actually beta acids also, but the alpha acids are what contribute the bittering. And then there's a, a number of different oils as well. The alpha acids have to get boiled for an hour to fully change them, isomerize them is what it's called, into the, what gives us the bittering compound that goes into it. So uh, if we only boiled it for a half an hour, it's not an exactly linear thing, but typically we'd get, let's say, half of the amount of bittering. Uh, of the potential bittering. The other side of this though is that those oils are what really give us the flavors and aromas that we want to get from hops and beer. If we boil that for an hour, and I'm going to go ahead and set my timer here for an hour now since I just put those hops in. When we boil for an hour, we actually boil away all of those oils and things. So all we really get is the, the alpha acids that are going to contribute to our bittering at that point. And that's why we'll see additions at different points along the way. If we have an addition right at um, zero minutes or right when we flame out, we get very little of the bittering potential of the hops, but we retain a lot of that flavor and aroma that, that's available in them. So by adjusting all these different times in the recipe, this is kind of going a little slower, so I'm going to pop it up a little bit more. So hops also come in two different forms. Um, a lot of kits come with pellet hops, which is what we've got here. Um, they have a real good shelf life, so they're great for, for kits where you're not sure how fast you're going to use them. They break up into solution real easily, so a lot of pro brewers use them because of those reasons as well. Whole leaf hops, this is what they look like when they come right off the plant. They're basically like little, little pine cones. <laughs> People that like these typically prefer them just because they're more traditional. The other thing is if you're using whole leaf hops, a lot of times you'll put them into a bag and just put the whole bag in there. At the end of the boil, we'd actually pull that bag back out and it makes it a lot cleaner beer. With the pellet hops I put in like I did, they're going to be a lot of pellet residue at the bottom that we've got to deal with later on. I personally don't mind that unless it's just a ton of it. Sometimes in my recipes, if I have a lot of hops, I might use leaf hops for the 60 minute addition and then pellet hops for the later additions. The pellets break up and go into solution a lot faster. So I like them for that. Leaf hops have got to absorb wort and excrete it, absorb and excrete a little bit. But within the hops, there's this kind of the outer layer that's like pine cones. And if we open this up in the center, we'll see the, the lupulin glands are this sort of yellow, if I can get this, yeah, can you see the, the yellow inside there? That's really the part of the hops that we want to use the most, is that, that little yellow, dusty looking stuff. All of the leaf matter, sometimes it can even give you grassy and vegetal flavors that we want to get away from. I think you get a little bit less of that from pellets than leaf, but all of those oils and the alpha acids are what's inside those lupulin glands. Sometimes pro brewers, when they're they're doing hop selection. They'll go out to a hop farm and they'll take them like this and heat it up and rub it in their hands. And then, then you can you can really smell all the differences of the hops. It's interesting to just be aware that that yellow stuff that's in there is, is the lupulin. That's maybe a little bit soft boil, but that's actually a pretty good boil right now. We've got the steam coming up. Stuff's volatizing away. I might bump it up just a hair. We're looking pretty good. I always like to start to think about yeast health. Happy, healthy yeast makes good beer, and anything I can do to keep it happier and healthier, the better. One of those is yeast nutrient. I use just a half teaspoon of this in a five gallon batch. And I also do Whirlflock, which helps just to clarify. It doesn't affect flavor at all. It gets in there, it bonds with other protein elements in there, and they get heavy and they drop out of suspension, thereby giving you a little bit more clarity from your beer. Irish moss is another thing that's the same material as carrageenan, which is basically seaweed. Um, and it just can help give you a clearer beer in the long run. So I'll be putting that in. I usually put it in with about 10 or 15 minutes remaining. And this is our yeast nutrient and half a whirl flock tablet. The whirl flock, again, just for clarifying. And then this is our last edition of hops, the five minute edition, which is a half ounce of Chinook and then the one ounce of Centennial. So I've got those all ready to go. And if I had other additions or things like that, I usually just make a line of those. And then at that point, then we'll start cooling. After we're done boiling, I'll put a lid back on it though, because at that point I don't want anything falling into it and 
try to keep wild yeast that's blown around us in the air away from it or bacteria or things like that. So uh, we want to try to keep it as clean as possible and then try to chill it as fast as possible too for a couple of reasons. One, because it's at a temperature that bacteria just love. Uh, so there's more danger of that. And the faster you can cool it, the less chance there is of getting what's called chill haze, which can affect how, how long it lasts before going stale, but also cosmetically and such too. Coming up on 11 minutes, so it um, doesn't have to be real precise. The directions on this actually say to, to add it to water and rehydrate a little bit. I don't usually do that. I usually just put it straight in. So that's our stuff. Add it in, we won't really see too much. Although you might see that whirl flock tablet floating around. And we got four and a half minutes till we're gonna add our last one. So uh, I'm gonna do a couple other things right now. One is I wanna get my, my coil starting to sanitize so that way that's ready. There's a couple different ways we can sanitize the chiller coil. Um, one way would be just putting this into the boil kettle for 15 minutes uh, and, and just by being in the boiling wort, it sanitizes itself. Um, it also gets hot though, and it's sometimes hard to work with because it's been sitting in that. So I usually will just put it down in my star sand sanitizing mixture that I've got here. Really only needs two minutes of contact time in here. So, but that's, at this point, we've got to really be thinking about everything that's going to touch our beer after this it needs to be sanitized. Two minutes of contact time in the star sand. Iodine-based sanitizer works just the same as well. I like the star sand because you can make a bucket of it and keep it mixed up. I sanitize a lot. If I keep the lid on it, keep it clean, it's good over, over a period of, of even a couple weeks. Um, Iodine-based sanitizer, like the Isle Star that I carry or something like that, sanitizes equally as good, just requires two minutes of contact time, still no rinse sanitizers, but you mix stuff up and then it loses its effectiveness after a day. So you dump it, basically mix it up fresh each time. It's half the price of this. So if you're uh, sanitizing you know, less than half the amount, then, or less than twice that often, then it, that's a better deal. But personally, I sanitize so often that it's, it makes more sense for me to have a bucket of this all the time. So I wanna make sure, get as much of it up on the places that might contact our beer. And we'll just let it sit in there when that's done, I'm just gonna pull this out, shake as much of it off as I can, so we're not putting any more of it into there than we have to, but it is a no rinse sanitizer. All right, so we're at five minutes now. We're gonna do our five minute addition of hops. This is almost my favorite part of it too, is just the, the smell when these hops go in here and start to break up. We just sprinkle them in, stir them in. You can actually see them break up almost immediately as they get into there. All right and that'll get down in there as it gets boiling as well. So it's actually starting to foam up a little bit. So I'm gonna just stir it, just make sure we don't have the boil get out of control while those hops are still dissipating in there. And we'll let the last few minutes of the boil finish up and then we will get started chilling. So I'm gonna pull this out of our sanitizer, shake as much of it back off as we can. It's not harmful to you though. I just like to get as much of it out of there as I, as I can. So not put any more of it than we have to into here. And then this will go into our wort. I'm gonna keep the, the spatula there because I like to kind of stir that. It helps if I keep that moving around, then uh, it can help, help cool it a little bit faster as well. I'm also gonna keep my sanitizer close by because if anything like when I go to check with my thermometer, I'm gonna to wanna to make sure I sanitize the barb of that first. Yeah. And that water be pretty hot coming out of there now. Really all we're doing is trying to run the cold water through the copper coil and just by touching the, the hot wort, it's gonna cool it down. Now our thought is trying to get this down to where we can pitch the whole solution at a temperature. It's not gonna hurt the yeast. It's not gonna be bad for it. So let's start sanitizing our, our fermenting bucket now. Since we gotta sanitize the bucket anyway, it's a great place to sanitize anything else we might be using, which is like the airlock. Now 
I'm just going to pour this straight in here. This is always a good time to check and make sure that the valve is closed. Yeah, I'm famous for pouring it out on my feet. just needs three minutes of contact time. I'm going to use my hands just to make sure all the parts of the bucket had some on it. When I pour it back out of here, I'll also turn this just to make sure that it pours out through all of the spots of the bucket. But the whole goal here is to make sure that all the parts, every part gets touched for at least two minutes, including the lid. And we'll go get our cold water in just a minute. I want to grab my hydrometer too so we could take a gravity reading of this before we actually add our yeast. So let's talk a little bit about fermenting actually while it's sanitizing. Um, so after we put the beer into here or the wort into here and add the yeast, we talked about that ideal, ideally most of the fermentation happens during the first five to seven days. Um, that's where it's going to be aggressively bubbling through the airlock. After that, it's still going to keep trickling along though. Um, I like to give it about two and a half weeks total. Some people do, you know, just do two weeks, but after two and a half weeks, you know that it's really gone far enough and that's much less chance of there being any sugars left that are gonna to create too much carbonation in your bottles. Um, temperature that it ferments at is, is an important consideration also as well, mostly for flavor things. Uh, most beers, happy zone fermentation wise is in the upper, mid to upper 60s. You can get 70 degrees. I used to like to say the cool side of room temperature is where you're going to get the best flavors. Every yeast has its own temperature range, though, that it works good in. Most yeasts, if we start getting up into the mid-70s and higher, then uh, you can get what's called esters, fruity esters and things that are um, they're not awful, but they're, they are an off flavor. They can range from being moderately pleasing and okay to, to pretty... Uh, not very good like rotten fruit kind of thing um, so typically being able to, to monitor your fermentation temperature helps keep them in check so but for just about all beers if we can keep it in the mid mid to upper 60s and even 70 you're gonna be fine I'm gonna check on our temperature and our wort here so I'm gonna sanitize this a little bit that's been about two minutes right see where we're at here I'm probably still pretty warm right now this chiller is actually stretched out because I used to use it for doing bigger batches it's already gone from 220 down to about 112 so we're making good progress but it's probably not the most efficient for doing this small amount but it'll get us there especially when we got all that cold water to add to it So I'm gonna pour this back in here. First thing I'm gonna do is just run a little through the spigot. That way we get some contact time, a sanitizer down in there. The sanitizer foams up a lot, but that can be beneficial in a couple of different ways. Star Sand has a saying, which is a great sales slogan, it says don't fear the foam. Uh, I don't like the foam, so I try not to fear it though. Uh, so I try to get as much of it back out as I can, but I'm not going to rinse it. Again, I'm going to maintain the, the no rinsing kind of thing. And then just try to get as much of the foam back off. They say it's a yeast nutrient, so it actually can be good for the, the yeast and the beer that's in here. They also um, say that it can get into nooks and crannies and places, so like the areas around our ball valve that, um, you know, that maybe might not have gotten in good, or if you're sanitizing kegs or things, that they can that foam can get into areas where if it was just liquid, it wouldn't. So I'll buy that. Uh, now when I pour out of here, I'm gonna just kind of turn this again. So trying to make sure that we had that sanitizer in contact with all the different parts of the bucket. Oh, there goes our airlock. We'll fetch that back out later because we'll need it at the end. So it might as well stay in there for the time being. And now we are sanitized and ready to go there. I'm just going to hit this with a little spray just in case 
been sitting upside down. Don't want to take any chances. Some wild yeast or bacteria got on there. We definitely want oxygen in the beer um, in order to help the yeast. That's something that the yeast definitely needs. When I'm doing this sort of beer at home, I have an oxygen stone uh, that I use uh, from when I'm doing a, a real serious thing. I'm going to try to just transfer in kind of aggressively, get it splashing into the bucket so that I'm getting some oxygen in. We're going to use this. Oh, I need to go on. I'm going to sanitize our strainer here. Again, anything that touches the beer has got to be sanitized. So. Um, that breaks it up into a lot of pieces, so a lot of different parts of the of the beer can get oxygen contact at that point. So I get a lot of oxygen in there. If I don't feel like I've got a good enough foam layer, I'll probably use the, the paddle and, and stir it and, and that. Sometimes people will pour it back and forth between the boil kettle and things. I feel like that's an easy place to get contaminated, and so, so I don't usually do that. But just just giving some thought to how can I make sure I've got enough oxygen mixed in with this is the best thing to help the yeast be happy and healthy moving forward. Also have a thermometer on the fermenting bucket that's a contact one so this is going to give us a pretty good idea of what the temperature is inside. Definitely want to make sure that it's below 80 degrees when I pitch the yeast so if once we get it mixed up if it's still up this high I'm going to wait a little while. Ideally I want to pitch around 70 degrees uh, my preference is usually to even pitch a little bit cooler than that if I can and then let it warm up to what my normal fermentation temperature is. So we'll take a look at that once we get everything into here. I think when we get down to about 85 degrees or so, maybe, maybe 90 in there, we'll go ahead and move it into the bucket. This is the area where most people, if you get a contaminated beer, where it's gonna happen. We're, we're just, just shy of 90 degrees right now, so we're actually making good time. It's going pretty fast. Um, but just missing one thing that, that didn't get cleaned and sanitized, uh, I think it's been a long time since I had an infected batch, but one I can think back on, I think at bottling time I had a bottling hose that, that just had a little bit of wort left on it and didn't get completely clean. That's a place for bacteria to, to hide and, and no matter how much you sanitize that, if it wasn't clean enough initially, then, uh, then they'll, they'll get in there and, and, and they will infect your beer. And nothing sucks more than opening five gallons worth of bottles of beer and dumping them down the drain. Dump this again a little bit to make sure any that ran down the sides there is out of the way. My usual practice here is, is I'll just about always add a gallon of cold water to begin with. In a plastic bucket, this isn't a big deal and we're cooled off quite a bit here. But if we were in a glass carboy, and if we had the wort too hot going into the glass carboy, it could break it, just the thermal shock, and that could be real dangerous. So if we had a, a gallon of water already in it that's cool, when that hits it, it's not gonna be as hot on the glass. So in this case, I know we're gonna need at least a gallon. We're probably gonna need two, maybe even two and a half. And uh, we'll top the rest of that off later. But that gives us a good starting point. I know I said don't fear the foam, but I'm going to get as much of the foam back off as I can. Just a little bit more time to get cold. Just check it one last time before we before we go dumping. Make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself.
I think we're looking good. We're about 85 degrees, 84 degrees. I think with the amount of cold water we've got, we should be down at a good pitch and temp, so. So we're gonna pull the chiller out. If I have to use that again, I'll go wash it off and make sure it goes back in the sanitizer. But so you can see the hot break and hot matter is going to be building up in the in the strainer, and I may use that paddle to uh, to kind of help clear the strainer a little bit. We've got a pretty good layer of foam from pouring through that. So we'll give that a minute to run through and then uh, when we get the paddle back, I'll sanitize that. And uh, as we stir that up, that'll keep running through a little easier. Right now, the strainer is just all bound up. Now it was probably sanitary from having sat in the boiling water, but I did stick it on our dump bucket and stuff. So I'm just not taking any chances. Make sure we get it sanitized a bit in here. And give it a little kind of stir this up. You can see as I'm doing that, this is coming out the bottom, splashing down into our, the rest of our wort, which is nice because we want to get that oxygen in there. But I like to keep it down fairly close to the bucket so we're getting oxygen but not any wild yeast and stuff that's floating around us. It's pretty concentrated at this point because we were working with the malt extract which was concentrated and we had, didn't add all our full amount of water in our boil so that we could do it with a smaller boil kettle so the the water that we're going to add to it to top it off now will actually bring it to what the proper concentration level should be which is why we're going to wait to take our gravity reading until until that point so gravity reading is really just a reading of the amount of sugars that are in it. It's actually the amount of solids that are in the wort, but primarily sugars. And that's what we're looking at is uh, that original gravity tells us how much sugar could potentially be converted to alcohol. And at some point here, I'm probably gonna decide that we've poured out enough. And if some of this was to go through here and not get caught in the strainer, it's not the end of the world. Some of that stuff's even good for our yeast, but Try to strain as much of it out as they can so that way we've got it cleaner in, in the bottom here. So I'll just stir this a while until I get it worked down and then we'll add the rest of the water. The, the gravity readings are helpful for a couple of reasons. One, the, uh, just knowing where we started at. The big thing that most people use it for is just figuring out their alcohol by volume. If we take their original gravity minus the final gravity and then plug it into a formula, uh, then you end up with what the ABV is. But over time, learning where those, that starting point, where the beer started, you can help you know how efficient your process was and knowing how, where the beer finishes up helps you learn how efficient the, the uh, fermenting process was. And over time, you can really learn a lot about just what you're doing. And especially if you do the same batches multiple times, different yeasts finish out different places and lots of stuff to learn. We've got a lot of solid stuff in here. Come on, there we go. But for most people, and, and everybody, it's nice to know what your alcohol content is. Because first thing that anybody's gonna ask you when you hand them a, can, a bottle of homebrew, they may say, whoa, what's the alcohol content on this? And, and they're usually surprised when you tell them it's five and a half percent or something. And like I said, also, if I didn't have the strainer, I wouldn't be worried too much about some of the solids getting into there. Uh, it's all gonna settle out in the long run. But by getting more of it out now, I can end up with a little bit cleaner beer later on. We're just about to where I'm gonna set this aside though. Okay, so we're gonna grab that other bucket. And we'll add some more water here. Oh, not that water, we want this water. We want the cold water. What's our temp reading on that right now? 
Nice, we're gonna be in a real good spot. When I pour this in, I'm gonna pour it relatively aggressively. We wanna see that good layer of foam on top of the, the wort in there. That tells us we got a good amount of oxygen into it. And then this bucket has a five gallon mark on this side over here. So I'm gonna be watching that and we're just gonna fill it up to that point. So one more gallon ought to do it. Another thing people sometimes will do to make sure you get enough oxygen in is to put the lid on and just shake it. Uh, I haven't had great results with that. Oftentimes if I've done it like with a carboy, it seems like the bung pops out and I get stuff everywhere or I don't have the hole in the airlock lid covered up good enough and it gets everywhere. And just by looking at the top, I feel like we've got a good amount of oxygen in it now. So we're looking good. Just a little bit more water. Right about there. Now when this starts fermenting, there's gonna be what's called krausing as the, as the yeast starts working. So it's good to have this good amount of headspace in here for that krausing to form. If we were doing this say in a five gallon bucket or five and a half gallon, there's really not enough room and there's danger of that coming up into the airlock. But in this case, we should be in pretty good shape. So um, I'll take this back off when we go to actually pitch our yeast, but I'm gonna move it up onto the table here, which will kind of help some of that water and the stuff mix together a little bit more. I could use the or spatula and stir it up a little bit, or um, if I had a, a wire whisk, this is a place to do that to mix it up a little bit more, but it's also all gonna mix pretty good with the yeast. And, and everything and even just mixing it from moving around like I did just now does a pretty good job. We're at 68 degrees which is as happy as I could possibly be. Let's go ahead and pull a gravity reading off it. So a hydrometer is what gives us that reading. We basically just need enough in here in our test jar so that the hydrometer will float. I also like to taste this. If I had sanitized this test jar and the hydrometer, I could pour this back in. But I usually like to taste it and see what it's like and not take any chances on what's going on with my sanitization. So it's a little bit hard to tell where it's at right now because of the foam. So I may give that a, couple, a minute or two to dissipate. But we're gonna look at this scale. It's right here. Water gravity reading will be 1.000. And we're gonna look at where the surface of the beer breaks on that. Let's say, I'm gonna hold on to it right now, but let's say it's at 1.060. As it, as it ferments, as the yeast eats that, this will sink lower and lower, and it'll probably finish somewhere down here around 010. Right now, give it a little spin, and let's see if we can tell where it levels out at. I'm going to say we're about 1.0, probably about 050 because the bubbles are filling a little space. So I'll make a note of that and remember to come back to it later, which is pretty good. Our estimated was 1.045. It could be 4.8. It's hard to tell exactly with this hydrometer, but I think, yeah, we're 50. We're at a good temp, so I'm uh, going to sanitize our yeast pack. Make sure that there's nothing on the top of that that can be a problem. We'll give that a minute in there. I even need, like to sanitize my scissors too. I don't put them all the way in. I'm just going to dip that. Bring this back down onto the ground here. Now with these smack packs, I like to just cut the corners. And what I'm doing is making a hole that's not big enough that that little pack inside can fall through. Otherwise you pour it right in. And we're just pitching our yeast right there. This corner allows it to 
flow out easily and not just come bubbling out. Squeeze it, make sure it's all out of there. I don't do any stirring at this point at all. I'm just gonna let that yeast find its way and, uh, and it'll do its thing. Spray that off just to be safe. Lid goes on really solid. Probably the most common thing that I hear from people who are concerned their yeast never took off. We find out that their lid wasn't on solid. Instead of seeing bubbles in their airlock, you actually find out that it's venting out one part of the lid. And everything is good. And they're always happy to find out that everything is okay. It's not ruined. We're going to leave, since we're in here, leave sanitizing solution in the airlock. You could just use water or clear spirits or some kind in there, but since we had to be in the sanitizer anyway, I'm going to do that. That goes right into our lid right there. Right there, I'm going to get it home, get it in a cool place in the house. Wait a little while and then we drink beer. And that's pretty much it.